Aaron here, and today on Backyard Biology, we're on safari to learn about giraffes, tigers, and the most frightening of all the beasts, the tapir. Okay, so maybe we're not actually on safari, but we are at the zoo, and the zoo is a great place to come and learn about all the animals us humans share the planet with. And it's also a great place where we can learn what we can do to prevent them from becoming endangered or going extinct. But have you ever come to the zoo and just wondered how all these animals came into existence in the first place? How did the elephant get such big ears and its long, funny nose? Why did the penguins lose their ability to fly and gain the ability to swim? And something we'll be focusing on today how can different types of bears, like the brown bear and polar bear, look different, live in different environments, and have completely different diets, but still be closely related? All the different characteristics, behaviors, and diets that you see in animals evolved to allow these animals to live in very specific environments. And those traits evolved through a process called speciation. So let's go to the lab and explore this idea further. Come on. So in order to understand speciation, we first need to understand what is a species? Well, a textbook like this one will tell you that a species is a group of interbreeding animals that are uh, reproductively isolated from other groups. But what does that mean in simple terms? Well, let's look at horses, an animal that most people are familiar with, and see how they fit the species rule. Right, so let's take a female horse who lives at a farm, and she uh, meets and falls in love with a male horse. And typical to any romance story, uh, they decide to start a family. So they mate, and the female gives birth to a baby foal. So this is the first rule to be considered a species. These two adult animals need to be able to breed and produce offspring. But the second important rule lies within the offspring. Once this baby foal grows up, into a female horse herself, she needs to be able to mate with another male horse and, just like her mother, give birth to another baby. So the ability of this offspring to mature and have her own offspring means that she is fertile. She's capable of producing more offspring. And this will proceed for generation after generation. Um, the as the offspring mature, they will mate, produce more offspring, and this is what makes a species. They're a group of breeding individuals which create offspring, the offspring are fertile, and they can go on to create other offspring. And importantly, this group is what's called reproductively isolated from other species groups, meaning that these mature animals cannot mate with animals of other groups. They will produce offspring in some chances, but those offspring are sterile. They cannot produce their own offspring. And so that is what it means to be a species. You, uh, produce, you breed, you produce offspring, and you cannot breed with other species groups. So now that we know what makes a species, let's go back in time. And by back in time, I mean let's go back three and a half billion years when scientists believe that the first ancestor that gave rise to all life first appeared on this planet. So you can think of this ancestor as a species, and it was capable of mating with other members of its species, producing offspring, and this process would occur generation after generation. And in fact, if there was no interference, this process would continue until the end of time, and we would be left today with just one species on this planet, our ancestral species. But we know that that's not true, right? We just saw at the zoo how many other animals we share this planet with, and that's not even all of the animals that we share this world with. There are millions of species. So how does one species branch and become millions? Well, that's exactly where speciation comes into play. So in order for speciation to occur, a certain set of steps have to happen. So let's take this generic species of big cats. So you have a single species, and over time, something happens to cause the, this species to become separated. So let's say a lake forms in a valley, for instance. And now the single group of big cats has been split up into two. And this is the level at which speciation starts to work. And it works for two reasons. 
The first is that animals in this population have very different characteristics or traits from animals in this population. Just like a population of people has different traits from one another, and when you break up uh, a single group into multiples, now some traits are over here that may not be over here, and that can cause differences over generations in how these animals look. The second way in which um, traits differ is that uh, the environment on either side of this lake can be different. So for instance, let's say on the left-hand side of the lake, it's drier and hotter, and it consists more of a grassland type of environment. And this grass dies in the dry season, and this would favor, for instance, animals that can tolerate heat better, but also which maybe have a fur color which enable it to um, camouflage into the environment better. Whereas, for instance, maybe on the right-hand side of the lake, it's wetter, so they experience more rain, and um, it's cooler, and it might even snow in the wintertime. And this would favor animals that can handle cooler climates, but also maybe they have fur color that enables them to blend into the snow better. And over time, um, this environment, these environmental differences, are going to put pressure on the traits of these animals. And that pressure will cause those traits that allow the animals to survive better in their environments to pass on to successive generations. And you'll start to see these generations look different from each other. So for instance, on the left we'll have animals acquiring a more sandy color so they can better blend into their environment. Whereas on the right, these animals start to become lighter so they can blend into the snow. And these traits will continue to be passed on generation to generation slowly acquiring them in a way that enables them again to survive better in their environments. And over hundreds to thousands of years, these traits will be acquired, and eventually these cats will become so different from each other that now they become different species, like the tiger or the snow leopard. And it's through, again, putting environmental pressure to favor certain traits, passing those traits down generation to generation, that causes enough differences to acquire within the populations of cats that now these cats are so different from each other that if they were to breed, they cannot produce fertile offspring. They are now reproductively isolated and thus considered two new species. And so this is how speciation forms uh, happens. You have a group of species, um, they get separated, differences in environment and individual characteristics causes gradual changes in the population and species, new species form. And that's also exactly what happened three and a half billion years ago to our ancestor. Our ancestor experienced um, separation, environmental differences, and slowly, over billions of years, we went from one species to now millions of species on this planet. So now that we know what makes a species and how different species come into existence, you can go to the zoo and look at all the different types of animals and probably realize that we need a way to organize all these different species to determine how related they are to one another. For instance, we can look at these flamingos and know that they must be more related to other types of birds than they are, say, to the giraffes. So do you think that there's a definitive way in which we can organize species um, based on how related they are to each other? You bet there is. Let's go back to the lab. Do you remember when we were talking about speciation, how I talked about how animals have differences in their traits? Well, the differences in an animal's traits are determined by genes. Not genes, but genes. And these live, uh, they're made of DNA, and they reside in the nucleus of every single one of your cells. And genes describe every aspect of you. They can tell you how tall or short you are. They can determine what hair color you have, or whether it's curly or straight. They can even just determine whether you're a male or a female. Genes describe every aspect of you, and they function the same way as a car manual functions for a car. Uh, a manual for a car will tell you how, how your car works, and genes do that for your body. So genes are made of DNA, and DNA is made, it makes up a code. And it's this code that can differ among animals, and it's this code that determines what traits you have. And so let's look at how scientists can use this code and use differences in that code to determine how related two species can be so that they can better organize them. 
So, to understand how scientists can use the genetic code to determine species relatedness, let's look at two species, the brown bear and the polar bear, that were just recently shown to be the most closely related bears within the bear family. So if we know that these two bears are related, we can assume that they at one time shared a common ancestor. And that common ancestor had a certain gene code. And over time, as uh, when this bear population experienced speciation, uh, the brown bear population and polar bear population slowly acquired differences in their gene code, which gave them the different traits that allowed them to become different species. And what's really cool is that scientists can use these differences to determine how um, long ago these bear populations um, split off from their ancestor. So specifically, scientists know how long it takes for one single cha change to occur in the genome. Let's say that change takes 100 years for just a single uh, gene change to happen. And if we compare the brown bears and the polar bears, we can see that over time they have had 100 changes happen in their genome compared to their ancestor bear. And so if we multiply that together, that will tell us that these bears split off from each other 10,000 years ago. So um, 10,000 years ago, this ancestor bear population experienced speciation um, it was split up into two groups. Uh, these groups experienced differences in their environments, which caused them to acquire different traits, changes in their genome code, and now today we have two different species, the brown bear and the polar bear. And scientists use this knowledge of how long it takes to acquire changes in the genome to uh, determine the relatedness of all sorts of species on this planet. For instance, it's a way that scientists um, have learned how long ago we shared an ancestor with um, the ape group, for instance, like chimpanzees. They can use this same understanding and apply that to humans. And they've done it for all sorts of animals that you even can see at the zoo today. So the next time you're at the zoo, you can look at all the different animals and know that all of these differences have arisen due to differences in their DNA code. And not only that, but using that same code, we can determine how related species are to one another. Thank you for joining me on this episode of Backyard Biology, and remember, biology is all around you, even at your neighborhood zoo. Thanks, see you soon.